All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Depends on where you are. Since we are such a virtual and distributed events, and we see participants from all around the world. So this is our keynote session, and we are so uh, glad to actually invite our keynote speaker here, Professor Anna Bessery. And uh, Anna Bessery is a professor in geospatial data science, and she has a lot of titles. And here, just to highlight a few of them, she is the UK Research and Innovation Future Leaders, uh, fellow, and she is also the director of the Center for Data Science and AI. And also she is the Royal Academy of Engineers, Engineering X Champion at the University of Glasgow. Anna uh, works on developing solutions that consider on availability and the biases of data and use this as a useful resource of data to make inferences about the underlying reasons that caused the miss, missingness or biases. And we are going to hear more about it along this track from today's talk. And Anna's research is funded by also a wide range of agencies, uh, including UK Research and Innovation, European Research Council, Royal Society, to name a few. And she also closely worked with our industry partners, including Uber and Google. And Anna is also the editor uh, in chief of the Journal of Navigation. And she also had received a wide range of prizes. And to just highlight one, she is the winner of the Winning Role Model in Science by Alexandro Humboldt and the European Commission Mary Cray alumni. So now uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, since uh, uh, Anna's internet is a little, a, a little bit weak there. And then we are going to give the stage to Anna. Share my screen in a second. Thank you very much, Ray, um, for the intro and also sharing this screen and um, driving this. So hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I love the whole um, model of uh, Spatial Data Science Symposium. It is online and very inclusive. And uh, that's really the gist of what I'm trying to talk about. It's about um, people who are missing but from the statistical perspective. So we are going to talk about how missing data can help us to understand cities, societies, and environment better. So if you go to the next slide, I just outlined the, uh, the talk today. So at the very beginning, we want to talk about the trend in data collection and how these type of new forms of data can help us uh, to have a better timely decision and understanding. Then we will talk about um, who we are missing is going to affect on affect our understanding of the society and uh, justify that democracy is not the autocracy of majority. We need to know who are those minority that we are missing. Then we look at how not having data can be viewed as useful data. And at the end, we will talk about some of the ethical issues about analyzing data um, that we don't have missing data. If you go to the next slide, um, that that's basically tell us a little about that sort of new form of data. Um, well, basically, what, whatever we do is to understand something. Um, I usually try to start with a scientist quote and a statement, and my favorite here is what Lord Kelvin, which is also one of our vice chancellor at the University of Glasgow was, um, saying that if you want to understand something, you need to collect data. Um, and well, collecting data about everything requires population level data collection. That is why, for example, we have census. It is not very uh, cheap. So we move towards the approximation of the population. We stratified and collect samples. Uh, that's great, but some people would argue that not necessarily people who may come from the same gender or age have a very good um, response that represent a society. So that's the criticism, but there are a statistical model developed how we can actually link surveys that are collected through some sort of mechanism uh, could be linked to the population. 
over the last few decades, we came up with some of the new technologies uh, that allowed people to go, for example, on social media and express their views without having any controlling mechanism. Those sort of self-reporting volunteer crowdsourcing platform have given us an unprecedented opportunity to understand a publish, population level data, and um, but with a relatively cheap and no effort, really. That's great because instead of going to a pool and ask people their view about, I don't know, the next US general election, um, you can just look at Twitter. But we know for a fact that is extremely biased. There are several people, group that are missing from those sorts of um, studies. And there is a major qu question, which one I should trust? The multi-billion tweet that tell me people are pro um, Europe, not Brexit yet, they are against Donald Trump, or a randomized survey that is very small, but randomized. There is a major question. So I want everyone and each of you think about that. If I tell you that there is a um, data set that covers 80% of the population, very high percentage, but there is no controlling mechanism on that. So there are 20% that are missing, but we don't know who they are. And there is a very small sample, maybe 100, and we randomize them. Which one do you trust more to do your analysis? That, that's something that we want to understand, which one we trust more. Where are the, the measurable, quantifiable um, element that we can actually compare the two and ideally combine the two? That's quite important. Just remember, if I say instead of 80, it's 90. Do you still stand on randomized survey or uh, you still go with the big data issue? Do you go for 95%? 90, you know, at, at some point, if you see where I'm going, I can get to 100% of the population going on a platform and talking about something. And that is definitely better than that randomized survey. I want to know where is that flipping point that we say, I don't know about 50% of the population with no control. I don't know about 60%. I don't know about 80%. But for 95, I'm happy. I want to know where are that point. And in this talk, we go through those sort of measures that are statistically developed to understand um, what is the, the goodness of a big data. If you go to the next slide, I just wanted to talk a little about why we bother. Um, so there is a quote from Donald Rumsfeld, although um, you know the, the man was not the first person talking about that, um, which refers to, okay, there are stuff that we know, and that's great. There are something that we know that we don't know, and we try to understand, and that's how we expand our knowledge. But there are always some unknown unknown. There are things that we don't know that even we don't know. And this is going to be a bit of a problem when we deal with big data, because those small minority that we are going to miss, they are also important. You see, uh, the very good example of this is, um, for example, public transportation and buildings, all of them are accessible, not because everybody is on a wheelchair and they need those sort of surfaces to get into the building. No, majority of people walk into the building, take the stairs and go to their room. There is a little minority for them. We hope we change the whole city and uh, public transportation to support them. This is the way that we design. We go for what is the absolute bare minimum need without which some people cannot live. And that becomes the basis of the design. Therefore, we need to know who we are missing. Um, there is a part of our group working on that sort of uh, mathematical models that actually show us how the cities are changing with respect to those, those minority there, which has got a very beautiful mathematical fractile shape. If we go um, to the next item that I put, yeah, uh, this is how they grow in the city. So as we grow, for example, there are a majority of the food that are halal in Europe, not because majority are Muslim, because there is no difference to me, for me, it's just 
the same taste, but for certain people, because of their religion, because of, for example, their biology, because of their um, different aspect, they can't afford losing that. And so we develop a mathematical model to understand what are they, um, the location and the model that they grow. So going back to the um, next slide and uh, talk about the missing data. Okay, sorry, there is a bit of an issue in the presentation of this. Um, so I just want to tell you about how we understand the quality of big data. So um, I appreciate if you look at line by line, I don't have any um, control over you know which one to highlight. Just imagine there is a data set that is very large and I want to, for example, understand the average of that um, because I think if I understand the average of that I can understand the average of the population you go with whatever is the variable of interest say income for example um, x1 is income of someone um, x2 is that but it is self-reported there is no controlling mechanism over this the whole population is n capital, but the number of people that we got their data, which is certainly below the n capital, because some people do not declare their income. Um, partly because we miss them. Sometimes you try to avoid answering that question because you don't want to. Um, your income is too high that you don't want to even declare that. But there are different reasons when we get to that. Um, we know that we are not going to get n capital number of records. So very simple thing to do is, okay, just imagine the formula of average, which is just summing everything together and divide them by the number. But I write it in a slightly different way. If you look at the second line, I put instead of just G, which is the value of income, I add a coefficient that is R. R is either one or zero. It is one, if you explain your, um, if you declare your income, and it is zero if you don't. So R basically tell me if I have the value for you or not. If it is zero, I don't have the, the whole thing, and still I can calculate the average. It doesn't affect my average, but it helped me to do a bit of a trick and go through the mathematical statistical model and extract the goodness measure for uh, big data. So I write it in the form of um, R to G, and G is the value, and R is the binary um, 0 or 1. And what I want to know is how much the average of income from that big data is different from the average of income from the actual population. So I just uh, subtract the estimated from the actual um, average. If you go for the common de denominator, you will see in the line 4 that I have uh, the the expectation of the product minus the product of expectation. And that's the definition of covariance. So I managed to formulate the difference between two average into some statistical thing that I know. And of course, you know that the, uh, the expectation of R, because it is one binary, is uh, 1 minus P, which is um, the, the, the kind of formula at the end. If we go to the next slide, I'll explain what these are, and I promise there aren't too many um, funny symbols anymore. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have, oh, sorry, Ray, I, this, okay. So this is exactly what we got. Um, there is a correlation between R and G. I, I just redesigned the, uh, the covariance, and I wrote it based on the standard deviation and so on. A standard deviation of G and N minus N divided by N, which is basically the product of R. Okay, um, correlation between R and G is the representation. Why is that so? You see, in randomized survey, there is no correlation between the income and whether or not you tell me the value. Because I choose you in a randomized survey with regards to your value, I just choose you randomly. So the correlation in randomized survey is zero. But here, we know that some people do not declare their income because there is a relationship here. So that, that's one thing that basically tell me how good quality is my big data quality. The second one um, is the standard deviation, how much the actual variable of interest here income varies. You see, this is the problem complexity. If, if the question was very simple, it was like, 
Um, is there anyone alive here in this room? Is there anyone listening to me? Even one answer is good. I don't need a billions of people going on Twitter and telling me that, yes, I'm alive or, yes, I was listening. Um, but if it is very complex, if it is something like, let's say, Brexit in the UK, it has got health elements, it has got economic elements, because it is very complex, I need to have more and more number of people to tell me their opinion. And the last part is actually the how much of the population I have their data. Okay, so just to translate this in a very simple language, in order to understand how good your big data is, there are three things that you can optimize. You can either remove the correlation between the value and the response. That means randomization. You can simplify your question or you can play with N and you go very, very large on N. That means um, basically um, you have three ways to tweak with this. Um, okay, we have a good quantifiable measure for N. We know how many records a big data has got. We can look at the um, complexity. The hardest bit is to understand if there is a correlation between the missingness and the missing value. Is there any reason that people with high income do not declare? Is there actually a correlation there? So here we want to actually calculate row. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll just go through the types of missingness because this is the key to understand if that correlation is valid. Uh, in the world of statistics, um, there are three types of missingness. I do apologize for the naming. I'm not responsible for that. It's very confusing. Sometimes missingness happens completely at random. There is um, no reason for that. It, we are all human and uh, we forget to answer a question. That is what we call missingness completely at random. Sometimes missingness is at random. That means it is at random, but it is correlated with a variable. That means, for example, here you see the age is missing. But we know that missingness of age is more happening when women are responding, maybe because society puts pressure for us to, on us to be always wrong or always young and the, you know, that, that sort of thing. So it is missing at random, but it is correlated with a variable. The one that I'm the most interested in, and that row is related, is the missingness that is not at random. That means there is a correlation between missingness and missing value. For example, if I come to you and say, after this talk, how many pints of beer you are going to have? And the number is, let's say, 11, you may not say that. If I ask you, what is your income? Even in an anonymous, anonymized survey, you may not say that. If I ask you how many papers you got rejected, you may not say that if it is high. So you see, it is missed because the value is very low, because the value is very high. So we want to understand that. It's very hard because the value that you don't have, you can't find the correlation, but the key is geography. So if we go to the next slide, I'll um, go through some of the things. The good part, the uniqueness, that sort of delicious part of geography is everything linked to one location, like a postcode or local authority or a state or something. And so you can link a lot of data and find that correlation and patterns of missing. This is what we've done for um, the national travel survey data that happens to be collected every year since uh, 20 or so years ago. And we looked at where the missingness actually happened. We uh, look at the data over years, relatively sustainable pattern, and we look at what we have from the income. And we know that missingness happens where more high income people live. Okay, that's quite interesting because I linked two data sets at aggregated level, and I find a correlation. And you may argue that, Anna, but that doesn't mean that people do not declare their income because of um, the fact that it is high or low. And I agree, this is not the causation. I just can calculate the correlation. But the brilliance of that trio that I showed you is I don't need the causation. All I need is the row, the correlation between missingness and missing value. So you see, geography help us to link several data sets and see if that correlation is valuable. 
Um, so basically, this is what all we do in, in our team. If you go to the next slide, I, I very briefly wanted to say that I, I am not the first person looking at missing data as useful data. Um, um, this has happened in the past. The best example of this is um, the, um, the thing that you all have uh, seen in World War II. We wanted to put armor on the airplane and, um, um, well, they mapped that um, where the airplane gets most of the bullet. Um, they assume because it is um, getting more of bullets, that's more vulnerable, that's more visible. But there was a genius mathematician, Ibrahim Wald, um, that actually looked at this map and said, you're wrong. Um, wherever we don't get the bullet is the most vulnerable because the, the airplane immediately fly, um, a drop. And we don't have even data of that airplane because they they just drop and they don't manage to come back to our land. Um, the other very good example of this is how we mapped, and by we, I obviously mean not me, um, mapped black hole. They just look at what is the effect that we don't get data. And that was uh, basically the, the purpose of that. Um, so these are some of the good example of how missing data can be actually used as useful data. And I just want to give some a few example of other things that actually can help. If you go to the next slide, um, this is uh, one of our projects that looks at how we can estimate the height of the building from uh, where GPS is blocked. So we know where the satellite is, we know where we are. If you don't receive the signal, that means there is an obstacle between you and satellite. As the satellite moves, it comes to your view and you can estimate the height of the building, shape of the building. As we move a little, um, sometimes signals come through windows and get to us. And that attenuates that because it went through some help us understand the um, material of the building where it bounced off or comes through. So if you go to the next um, slide, you see that you know when it bounced off, there is an attenuation that we calculate and we can see what type of material it has gone through or bounced off. So this is one of our projects that we look at how we can actually model that. If you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to give a very good example that how you can actually calculate the goodness of data based on the very simple formula that I showed you, we can actually calculate the effective sample size of a big data. So instead of saying there are two billions of people walking um, on tube and because they have a smart car um, and I wanted to measure the, the traffic, um, okay, instead of looking at two billions of people on the social media and I want to know if I was uh, getting a randomized survey, how many I should recruit. This is um, basically the formula. Um, there was, at the beginning of the COVID, there was a little uh, experiment in the UK that we were involved, um, and there was a failed app. I was not involved in the development of the app, but um, UK government was pushing about collecting the location data. They put that as a pilot in Isle of Wight, and uh, they told us that we collect location data of people because we want to know where people go and that helped us to understand the COVID situation. I did a very simple calculation and I said, well, you don't need that uh, population level or big data because not everybody um, installed the app. Um, if we say 50% of the population installed the app, which was the case at the time, and there is a little correlation between um, who report that and um, their spatial correlation, the effective sample size using the formula is 400. So basically, if you record 400, um, sorry, if you look at the uh, small sample and rec um, collect this number, sorry, recruit this number of participants, you're good to uh, calculate a very realistic view of the city. You don't need to go through all the 140,000 people in Isle of Wight and collect data. So, so this is something that uh, is quite important. And you may say that doesn't make sense, Anna, that um, this number of population installed the app and with such a little correlation, which you see 0.005 is not that much. We just need 54 um, to, to get exactly the same result. And I uh, must say that's a very interesting result because 
um, it was shocking to me. I have a very good collaborator, Professor Jiali Meng of Harvard um, Data Science Institute. Uh, and I was talking to him about this a spatial correlation because very low. And he gave me a very good explanation about why this is a very low number. Basically, he said, Anna, if you want to understand something using randomized survey, it's like you want to taste a soup. You basically sear your spoon and taste it because you take the very randomized sample of that soup. With big data, you don't steer, you just go and taste different part of that big pot of soup. So you need more, more, more to understand what is actually is the taste of the soup. So randomized, basically a steer it first, and one is representative. For the other, you need to have much more. So that 54 or 400 in terms of the population is quite low because of that. If you go to the next slide, um, just wanted to say that usual case is when we don't have data, we can't prove anything. And that's true. The absence of evidence and evidence of absence. But with big data, that's a huge potential for us. Just imagine I give you a book that I have written and I ask you to find for a typo. You read the first page, you can't find anything. Second page, still okay. Third page, okay. At page five, you cannot say, Anna, there is no typo because a lot to go. Um, I may have typos from page six on board. But when you read, let's say, 99% of that book and still haven't found anything, you can say, well, Anna, it's very unlikely that you have the, um, the typo or it is just one at the end, which is not statistically very significant. You, you're good to go. There is a rule of three by Hanley and Lipman that says, um, basically, whenever you want to uh, look at zero cases or absence of data, the level of confidence interval is three by the population size. Because in big data, the effective sample size is relatively low, that absence of data can potentially can be used as the evidence of this. So because let's say nobody complained about something, you can assume that that thing is okay. It's not something that, it's like reviewers on Yelp. Most of the time we complain when there is a comment, it is negative, and we talk about that. But if you don't find anything negative, you can assume that's good because everybody had access to that. Um, the next slide uh, looks at some of the ethical issues that I don't want to just go through them. But um, just remember, we are dealing with data sets that people intentionally did not give data. That's a big question. Can I impute the value based on the correlation and everything that I can, not for individual, but still at a level that people decided to remain silent. Is it ethical? Well, one can interpret ethics as doing no harm. One can interpret ethics as doing good when we can. So it is important to have a very good judgment about ethics of data that we don't have, because when you don't share your data, that's up to you, but I can find ethical ways to calculate that. Is this procedure is okay or not is something that we can discuss. Um, the other part is, um, yeah, everything is based on the correlation and that's a bit of a tricky, anything that can be correlated to anything else. And sometimes uh, when we find the result, we propagate the uncertainty back through the model to see if we can actually get to the same model at the beginning. And that's very important to do because when you don't have something, it could be because it doesn't exist or maybe because people do not give you that data about uh, that thing. And um, it is quite important to remember that all the time. Um, and um, people are a bit nervous when um, they talk about data that they didn't share and you calculate something at not at an individual level, but still that's a bit risky and looks very intrusive when you have that. So we need to have very, very clear communication about the perception of risk, because if that's the concern, um, rules, legislation, and more importantly, ethical framework needs to be developed. Most of um, uh, data protection regulation are for the data that we have. I haven't seen anything about data that we don't have. Okay, if 
if we go um, to the um, next part, I just wanted to summarize that. Um, well, quality matters. In a spatial data, we have a very good uh, quality measures. We say spatial accuracy, temporal accuracy, um, about, but incompleteness is one of those quality measures. And I think we should uh, put more emphasis on that. Relative sample size is not the absolute sample size, just uh, always we are being misled by how big a data set is. And when we calculate the effective sample size of that using all the um, magic that we have, we are shocked by um, how little and non-informative it is. Um, and one on the other thing that I wanted to say is we find sometimes the pattern of missingness and use that for the informative imputation that we have. Um, that requires a lot of domain knowledge. So we um, really want to work with you and any data set and knowledge that you have got because we have the mathematical and the statistical model for that that I very briefly high level showed you, but we need to test it on many, many applications to make sure that we are not missing any part of thing that is related to missing data. But the only thing that I wanted to do with that data set is when we have social media data, smart card data, as opposed to some of the traditional data, such as polls and um, um, surveys, we want to combine them to be able to have a very good, timely, temporally, very frequent data and understanding of the thing that is changing very fast, but also have that reassurance. So the best is hybrid all the, all the time. And um, I just wanted to say that quality of service and ethics are highly correlated. Usually we, we set the ethical framework, but here, if you don't have data, it will change a lot of quality measures that we have. So on that point, I just wanted to thank you all. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, I just listed some of those funding that uh, Ray was mentioning, and um, I'm extremely grateful uh, for all of these um, that fund our team, um, but these are just input for the research. Next slide is some of, and I must say that, I, oh, there is not uh, the final version of um, the list, that these are the people that I um, um, that are helping us with the development of the uh, the whole work. So there are almost 42 in the team that are working on different aspects, some on visualization, some on the statistical, some of on the applications um, of this data set. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, thank you.